I'm really excited to talk to you. So this this current issue is about the future of community. And Good. as you know, I lived in a spiritual community that suffered from many of the problems that are typical of spiritual communities and eventually collapsed. I interviewed already for this issue, uh, Stephen Douglas, who was one of the, he was an early member of the farm in Tennessee, which was one of the biggest and longest lasting communities that came out of the counterculture of the 60s. And it's still going, but it's undergone a lot of changes. And I wanted to talk to him about, well, what did, what did they learn in the last 50 years? Um, and that was interesting. And then I talked to uh, Theo Eisenman, Eisenman, uh, a friend of mine who is a landscape, uh, sorry, uh, an urban designer, a professor of urban design. And he was talking about the potential of the ways that cities could be designed differently so that they, they were truly supporting the upliftment of the people that lived in them, you know, rather than dragging them down. Uh, and I found that very fascinating. You know, his point was, like it or not, more and more people live in urban environments. And if we don't improve the way urban environments are designed, we're damaging people, you know, by the millions. Uh, and so that was very interesting. But I guess I wanted to speak with you because my, so two, two reasons. One, I have an online community, which is a you know, small few hundred people community. But I talked to you when I, when I started the community, we talked about the ideas of somathesy. And I really tried to incorporate those into the design of the community. And it's taken a lot of work, but it's really, it's, it's taking hold. And the idea was to, to, was to see the, the foundation of the community as a vehicle for uh, mutual learning and, and which gave everyone the opportunity to share their wisdom and everyone the opportunity to learn from each other. And it took a lot of encouragement to, to get people to be willing to share. Um, but it's really been, especially the last year, it's been really self-generating and all kinds of amazing things have, have come out. And I feel like we've managed to create a cohesive community that doesn't, I mean, it's still, it still has me as a, as a kind of central point. Uh, but I feel like the, that central leadership is, is fairly light. Um, and I, I imagined at some point it would go away, but I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if, how this is going to work. But, but what I wanted to talk with you about is there's an underlying complexity to community that needs to be sort of brought to light. You know, you can't just bring people together. I don't think, I, I think even if you were to design, for instance, the perfect city, people would still need to engage. And, and there would need to be some real thought gone into how to help people engage. Uh, and, on, you know, this, the counterculture, you were, you, you grew up kind of an, an excellent, uh, another of the, of the large experiments of the counterculture, which had a lot of amazing aspects and a lot of the pathologies of, of those cultures. But I feel like what you're doing with somatosy and warm data, I don't know if it's, it might be too far to say it's the solution, but it, it feels like it's the blueprint for uh, what, what it will take to design communities that work. Uh, that's my opinion. And so I wanted to talk to you about well, maybe we can just start for the readers who don't know, if you could speak a little bit about somatosy and or warm data. Uh, I sometimes don't exactly know how those two relate, uh, <laughs> but I may be a little behind you. Um, somatosy came first. Well, no, actually warm data came first, but then as I started to try to study warm data, what happened was somatosy, which brought me back to warm data. It was an interesting, they're, they're very 
wound into each other. Mm. So, um, I was interested in stuck systems. Okay, and uh, the the group of researchers that I had put together, um, and I we put this idea that we were going to. We were going to create a research problem on how systems get unstuck because it's clear that the sticking is not in the parts it's in the systemics mm. it's the, the processes that that multiple aspects of a system or you know various contexts get themselves into a tautology if you will you know um so what does it take to cut something unstuck when the relationships in multiple directions are reinforcing the stuckness. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you can look at the education system or the economic system or the health system, or you can look at the family, or you can look at the psychological mental health world, or you can look at the, you know, the world of spirituality and religion. And you can say, okay, we have systemic issues all the way through all of these things. They're stucknesses. So this question seemed like it was going to be um, really, you know, a fantastic question. It turned out that it wasn't a fantastic question. Ha do you, have I talked to you about this before? Are we? Okay. Yeah, you go, you go, because all right. you're so, talking to a lot of people right now, not just me. All right. Okay. <laughs> so what we thought was, all right, this will be good. Um. And then we tried to think of a stuck system and we started to think about it and we realized that we couldn't actually define a stuck system. And the reason we couldn't define a stuck system is that in order to actually attend to the stuckness, you have to um, essentially draw out or, or you know, obscure all the other processes that are all around it because in order to keep something stuck, it takes a lot of change. Mm. Okay, mm. so the only way you can define a stuck system is if you don't want to see those aspects that are in wild um, compensatory processes to try to hold this one bit stuck. I mean, if you just think about this for a second, it makes perfect sense. If you have a, a family that's stuck in an abusive pattern, Okay, in order to keep that pattern going, there's all sorts of relationships outside the family with schools and work and all kinds of things that are doing double backflips to try to, you know, keep this child uh, able to sit in a chair or to keep this, you know, uh, employee coming in and people right. are covering for her and right or there's doctors that are so there's all these other contexts that are in all sorts of compensatory behavior. So where's the stuck system? Mm. Okay, so this was where we decided, all right, this is a, not really a great question. Can I interrupt you just for a second? Because I'm having kind of a realization as you're speaking. Uh, okay. so, so just as another example, in, in the spiritual community I was a part of, there was a big stuckness around power dynamics. And, and as you were saying that, I was just thinking about how many backflips we were all doing to maintain that power dynamic, you know, regardless of whether we liked it or not, because the power dynamic itself, that stuckness is essentially a chaotic event that is constantly endangering the whole system into some kind of implosion. And right. so to keep it from imploding, everybody's flipping and, and, and doing all kinds of things I see what you mean. Like, if you just look at the stuckness, you're not really seeing the picture of what's supporting the stuckness. Right. So you, hopefully this is going to start to pull together for you. So what we decided was that we didn't have a very good question, but, you know, still we were going to go ahead with it because we, we just felt like if we kept going, we would get somewhere. And we did. So we came up with this idea of studying the body in paralysis as being the best sort of example that we could come up with of what could be a stuck system. Mm. All right. And we went to this paralysis clinic in Italy called Centro Studi 
uh, neurocognitiva rehabilitacion or something like that. <laughs> um, and um, honestly, to my thinking, to this day, even though that was uh, almost 10 years ago now, that's the best systemic work I've ever seen. Mm. Um, it's the most beautiful work going on on the planet, if you ask me. And so it was there that I saw so many of the theoretical things that my father had brought in um, actually in a kind of art form of mutual learning. Mm. And um, and it was beautiful. Uh, and I had no idea what was going on. I kept getting these emails from these really sweet people. We're using your dad's ideas for this therapy. And I heard that. I thought instrumentalization. I thought implementation. I thought run, don't walk. Like, I don't want anything to do with this. Because usually when people implement those ideas, they jump a logical type and they get it wrong. They turn it into a generalization of a methodology and they stake the pivot in the wrong spot. Mm. Okay. And so I was expecting that I got there and that is not what I saw. And the first thing that I saw was that the, the practitioners were working with the patients in a way where they would, for example, have a small wooden block with a spiral carved in it. And they would start by asking the patient, um, what would it just, you know, hypothesize use your, in just verbal terms, what would it feel like if you could run your finger around that spiral? Okay, so perception, description, perception, memory, description, perception, memory, description, ver verbal, visual, tactile, relational contextual okay so there's a whole lot of um senses that are being activated mutually to do that all right mm -hmm. if you look from the outside the spiral has nothing to do with the paralysis the paralysis features itself as a you know the body is frozen the arm is tucked in tight the hand is clenched what the heck does this spiral have to do with anything? Mm. Okay. Beautiful. I mean, this is how you do it. But there's so much in here, the nuance of which is like a gazillion miles away from anybody trying to solution a problem mm -hmm. by articulating the problem and finding a solution. Right. Right. Okay. And so what in so then the the practitioner would very slowly um, move the if the patient had a hand that still had feeling in it, move the finger very slowly around this little carved spiral. I mean, how analog can you get, right? Nothing's beeping, nothing's attached to anything, nothing, nothing. Just the the two human beings touching each other, touching a little wooden block with a spiral carved in it. And again, the description, okay? But the description is not what did you feel? Mm. It's what's the difference. Mm. Okay, so when you have to describe what's the difference, you're in a process now where you're describing two feelings at the same time in relation to each other. Plus, both of those are taking place at in visual, tactile, <laughs> memory, verbal, relational contextual so you get this very um multi process multi-sensory description process and these ways of knowing ways of learning ways of being perceiving in the world are having to um mutually find each other mm. Mm. okay and that happens differently in you than it happens in me then no one can see it there is no right answer. There's no, this process that's taking place is profound in its complexity and it has to be wild. There's mm. no controlling it. 
it's it's undomesticated. When I say wild, I mean it's un it's it's undetermined. Mm. And we could so this so this is fascinating, right? So I start to look at this spiral thing and I'm like, okay, if this is the response to the issue that I perceive as paralysis or a stuck system. Wondering what are, what do these people think pathology is? Mm-hmm. What are they seeing as the pathology? What problem are they solving for? Mm-hmm. Okay, because it's not the frozen hand. Most physical therapy processes would be in massage or they would open the hand or there would be all this attention to that part of the body, which is paralyzed, et cetera. This is, I mean, they, they're not even interested in that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I ask, what are you, what, what is pathology to you? And they said, it's an organism's inability to make sense of its world. Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So this is the place where somathesy is born mm. right here. Because what I started to see is that what they were doing was um, not healing. They weren't putting people back to how they were. They weren't fixing any of the parts. They were allowing for a a multi-contextual mutual learning to take place between all these different aspects of the body, the nervous system, the cognitive system, the relationship, the the person, Mm -hmm. okay? The person in relationship to the person that they're working with, the person in relationship to their life, their history, their family, their idea, their identity. So this mutual learning, then how do you begin to think about as a researcher, what, how do you think about what to do with this information? Where's the information? Where's the learning? Okay. And the thing is, you can't point to it. Right? It's, it's something about the way that falling in love makes it possible to listen to music in another way. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that kind of a, a relationship where there's something that happens in one context that it makes it possible to perceive something in a completely different context. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's, you can't make a, a direct correlation. It's just that you can, but you can't, but you can. I mean, there's nothing about the falling in love or getting your heart broken that is repeated in the piece of music, but the landscape of emotional experience that gets opened is shared in the two different spaces, right? Okay, so this is similar to what's happening in this. Um, So, you know, what do you do with the information? And that was where we realized we need another kind of information because all the ways of thinking about information pull things apart and look at the bits of information. What do you do when the information itself is alive and multi-contextual? Okay, that's warm data. Right. Okay, so there's warm data meets somathesy. Beautiful. Um, I'm very, I I really love your work, by the way. I think (laughs) I always get a buzz when I talk to you about it. Um, And, you know, in, in relationship to community, when I spoke with you before setting up the, my online community, we talked about somathesy and <clears throat> what I took away from that, which relates to what you're saying now, is that I shouldn't, I, I shouldn't focus so much on the content of the community um, mm. or, or that's not really where, that's not what's going to make or break the community. It's the context that's, and I said, okay, so what I'm doing is setting up kind of a contextual framework for human engagement. And, and I took away that people need to be able to connect freely with one another, that those connections shouldn't be controlled, 
I mean, they need to be minimally controlled in, in certain ways, of course, but they, there should be a wildness to it. They should, they should be able to, uh, as I would put it, they should be able to share what's, what's in their heart to share. They, they shouldn't feel constrained. Uh, and, and then you have to kind of let it ferment or something freely. Um, and I feel some community that I, some communities that I've been involved with, there's been so much imposed in terms of ways of thinking and ways of being that eventually the system kind of crumbles under the rigidity. Um, so I'm curious now that we've kind of fleshed out somatosy a little and, and what I'm really hearing, somatosy and warm data, what I'm really hearing from you and have heard from you in the past uh, is that it's just so much, this, like, this is my layman's interpretation, you know, it's, what we tend to look at is such a small part of such a big complex picture. And I love what you were just saying about how if you fall in love or if you have your heart broken or like you're just having a great day, a piece of music is going to sound different. Mm -hmm. but, but how is that? What, what's doing that? You know, uh, right. the, the philosopher Heidegger talked about moods, this, he, you know, which is like if you're in a good mood, that's a feeling kind of, but not really. And it affects everything else you feel. Uh, and yeah, I'm just, I'm just really loving what you're saying and wondering how do you see that in relationship to human interaction and community? Okay, well, let's talk a little bit about map and territory and logical typing. Mm -hmm. Because I, you know, I, I didn't ever used to want to talk about this because it, it takes a long time to get this into your belly. Um, but now I kind of feel like we don't have time to not talk about this anymore. Oh, we have to yeah. talk about this. Um, because the way of perceiving the, the epistemic world of industrialism and the you know mechanistic metaphor and all that stuff um has obscured and in some ways um really hindered the the capacity for perceiving these differences in abstraction and so we make a mistake all the time yeah, yeah. Okay, so the place where you see this the most is, for example, in communities where you get a mission statement and a bunch of rules. Mm -hmm. Okay, which I think you pointed to that you kind of didn't do that. And this is the idea here is that a community needs an identity. And so you want to know if people want to be part of this community by knowing if they resonate with this identity. Um. But of course, this is this is this is map. Meanwhile, territory, everybody's going to have a different idea of what that mission statement means to them. And everyone's learning and growing and changing. And so their relationship to that mission statement is going to learn and grow and change. So you you're hoping for some sort of alignment with this thing that's static with all these things organisms that are shifting it's like you know it, yeah there's a lot of things we do in life that are like this but let's just think about community right now so um these there's another kind of community which is just the people who are living next to you and if you think about that kind of unintentional community and how you would do that, where you wouldn't expect people to think alike, you wouldn't expect them to eat the same foods. You wouldn't expect them to have the same spiritual practice or to, um, you know, even speak the same language. So you give them so much more room to be. And so you don't have to get angry at them 
when they do their asanas wrong or they fall off the vegan wagon or they, you know, somehow didn't make it to the level of, of, you know, whatever kind of thing you think that they should be, they are not, you're not holding them to that. And likewise, they're not holding you. So what you get actually is this incredible possibility of mutual learning and and confusion but it's alive Mm -hmm. it's allowed to move and shape and breathe in and breathe out and change shape and you know it moves and you wouldn't think twice about that but the second you think we are going to make a community and it's going to be focused on this suddenly you lose all that breathing room Mm. Um, so the other thing is that you've got people coming in to those kind of communities with a a strange sort of relationship to us, them, I've chosen to be in here with you. I'm not in alignment with the outer world. Right. Right. And this is strange. (laughs) This is a, another error of logical typing because you can't actually do that in a way that is, um, I mean, people try, it's called cult and, and, and it doesn't, um, it doesn't work because it, you aren't okay. You can't draw a line around that community and suddenly, you know, have people not be part of the world anymore. They need to go to the dentist. They have families. They have friends from high school. They have kids that want to go, you know, marry somebody somewhere else. They they want to use, you know, technology. They want to listen to music. They want to, like, they want to do stuff. They want to be part of the, they want to be part of the world. Mm-hmm. They, you can't actually live in that tight boundary. Mm-hmm. So, so there's this strange relationship with the kind of privilege of entering one of, uh, you know, an intentional kind of community, um, but actually you have a back door. If it doesn't work out, you'll leave. And that's if you think about ancient you know groupings of people living together that little bit there Mm -hmm. that wasn't there the back door there's no back door baby right and so the thing about that back door is that it comes with here you can link into the whole sort of world of individualism and um, all of the my needs, my space, you know, the I statements, the um, diagnostics of, you know, personal mental health issues instead of interpersonal contexts. Mm. Mm. Okay. Um, so, what I see right now in terms of this question of community is that, you know, we have a thing in warm data called people need people and people need people is um, basically it's a project to do warm data in 10,000 communities around the world. And, um, and it's also the name of the online process. Mm. Um, People need people. And People need all kinds of people. People need people that are different than them. People need people that are like them. People need people that piss them off. People need people that love them. People need people that they love that don't love them back. People need people that are outrageous and inspirational. And people need people that are just boring and quiet. And, you know, people need people. People people need an ecology of people. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because actually you are an ecology of selves. And so who are you isn't really located in you. 
It's mm -hmm. very much about who you're in relationship with. Right. And if you monocrop your identity, it's not too long before you're going to chafe and rub up against those limitations because you're not a monocrop of identity. Mm. You're a, a multitude, right? Mm -hmm. I am a multitude. So we need that, that ecology of possibilities of being, you know, confused or irritated or, you know, disoriented or inspired or, um, and if you start by having a lot of like-minded people in the same room together, and then you shut the back door. So, so that's one issue is where's the edge of the community. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I think is really important to have it be a super permeable edge. Yes. You know, I just want to comment on the fact that that is one of the things I really, I, I'm kind of remembering better what I was getting from you when we first talked about this like five years ago. And, and one of them was this very strong sense that because, because I've experienced community with a, that attempted to maintain a very solid boundary, mm. you know, impermeable. And where, you know, it was almost like you lived in a fort and then when you went to the dentist, you know, you, you tried to barely engage. Uh, yeah. and then and then get back in quick you know because you were out there like in the wilds uh, but talking with you what I started to see is if you think about communities as kind of a gated or bounded region which is kind of the model we tend to think of uh, you end up with certain kinds of problems and, and what I took away from our earlier conversations was to really think about two things one to, to think about community as a as an opportunity for a certain field of engagement, you know, and not to think of it as a person's whole life. You know, the mm. communities yeah. that, that try to be a person's whole life can't possibly provide everything someone needs. But uh, I see community as, as a possibility to engage with like-minded people who, who have kind of self-identified around certain ideas or interests and have the means for communicating and engaging with each other. And there's a perfectly, there's, there's kind of a no boundary. You know, you kind of come in and out and in and out and it's very hard to know who's in and who's out uh, at any yeah. given time because people are just coming and going. And I don't know, it, it helped me loosen the idea of, a, it's almost like we think we think of a community as a thing that exists independent of the actual human engagement. And, okay. and it, that's, it does, map, that's yes. map and territory problem. Okay, please. Right, right there. Okay, so you have a, an idea, an abstraction that is the community, right? And then you have the people who are actually the community that are always out of line with the community. Right. <laughs> And so if you hold them to the community, the abstraction, the people are going to have a miserable time. And most people's experience of community, at least after a while, at least in my experience, is that it gets pretty miserable. Right. Yeah. And you feel trapped. You feel, you well, either you feel trapped or you you start to get off on making people feel trapped or you get off on being the victim of being trapped or you, I mean, it's like so many permutations of yuck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And I, I feel like, uh, what I've, what I was getting, what I've gotten from you in the past and I'm hearing now is, is that the, you know, there, there does appear to need to be some, elements that help a group of people cohere around a certain like-minded interest. But those should really be as minimal as possible. Um, and the more invisible the the more invisible the the connective tissue is that kind of allows for the engagement and the freer people are to engage, to come and go, to be themselves, to bring more of who they are you know, to the table that's been set, the, the more, I don't know, it feels like the more 
easy it is and the more healthy it is for, for, for people to just be together. And they can come and go as they need to. I mean, most of us are already in many communities. Yes. You know, many. You are probably, you know, the, there's a whatever an online you know dog community that you're affiliated with or there's a jogging group that you want to be with or there's a you know women who have survived breast cancer community that you're with or as a spiritual community or your you know the community of your childhood friends or the community like we already have multitudes of them right right and it's just that we could even forget that we have those communities because they aren't bound. And so they don't, we forget that that even is a community. Right. Um, and that's really interesting. I mean, I think that might be the definition of the most exciting community is the one that forgets it's a community. Right. Right. That's because, really, yes. Yeah. Where they're actually, it's the opposite actually of what you were saying earlier, where the idea is the community needs an identity to exist, right. right? It's the opposite of that is there is no communal identity. People are just engaged together around something and they don't even think of themselves as a community. Right. Well, so what are they thinking of? Now, this is where it gets interesting because this is where we're really in trouble. The reason, and to my thinking, that people crave this idea of community is that we live in a world that doesn't provide that spirit of people needing people. Mm. Okay, so we crave this sense of people needing us and us needing them and this kind of collaborative experience. We can do it together. We want to have that feeling. Mm. Because we are that, mm -hmm. okay? You are how many hundreds of trillions of organisms? You are symbiosis. You are, like, we are this, okay? So we crave it as some sort of, you know, externalized social structure that we can play out into. Um, and we're not... We don't know how to do it. Right. We don't know how to do it. And we don't know how to do it because we keep getting kicked back into this individualistic place. Right. Um, into, into like a place of separation. A place of separation, isolation, um, you know, all the bad habits mm -hmm. of seeing other people through a lens of reductionism and ourselves. Mm -hmm. And it happens just like that. Mm -hmm. And so I hear all the time, all of this, like, we need to collaborate and we have to have a community spirit. And, and then at the same time, it's, I'm not responsible for other people's feelings, but everybody has to take accountability. And <laughs> we have to make good boundaries, but we have to collaborate. And, um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, really counter indicated uh, memes happening simultaneously. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you need to lose yourself to be part of the community, but you have to have a strong sense of self or you can't be a useful member of community. Right. Right. Um, so again and again, we're rubbing up against this industrialism, the old habits of thinking of industrialism, trying to produce improvisation, okay? Because that's what I really see community is, is, is improvisation. If it's actually doing right. something, it's improvising, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and a community is never what it is. It's always becoming. It's always becoming. It's keeping becoming. It's, it's never. That's what right. It was or what it was. It's always becoming. Just like you. Like, who are you? Well, are you who you were when you were seven? Well, being who you were when you were seven 
brought you to who you were when you were 15, it brought you to who you were when you were 40, brought you, you know, here we are. Mm. So this is the problem is that the premises that, um, and I'm, I'm just writing a piece about this right now. Jeff, it's really important to think about what we mean by common sense. Mm -hmm. Because that stuff isn't in, it's not explicit. And it's coming from all directions. And it's a transcontextual um, kind of hijacking of the possibility of being in an improv improvisational, improvisational people need people modality. Right. And your, your finances say, watch out for yourself. Your, you know, your, your broken heart and your identity says, if you, if you let go of the edges of yourself, you're going to get used and abused. Mm -hmm. Your, um, you know, in all these different directions, you've been trained to figure out what's in it for you try to get ahead okay we're always on this path of i need to better myself which is like what actually is that mm -hmm. what is that mm -hmm. um and it, you know it goes around and around and these things creep back in so the premises into which we try to do this thing called community are infected to begin with Interesting. So this is fantastic. And I just wanted to finish with a quote. Uh, this is a quote I got from your film about your father. And I think it's a quote of his, but I don't know because I've only ever heard it from the film, but uh, I use it all the time. It's become, you know, one of my top three quotes. Uh, and it says, and I may be misquoting, but it's this is the gist. Um, the source of the greatest problems of the world is the difference between the way we think and the way things are. Close and, enough. You know, close enough. I know it's a little, yeah. it's a little, it's a little off, but that's the gist. And uh, and I feel like that's what you're always addressing is trying to, you know, earlier when we were off the record, you said humanity is epistemologically fucked. And I think what you mean is the way we think is so far from the way things work. Like it's hard to know how we're, we're gonna actually be able to get that together again. It's hard to know how we're gonna get that together again because uh, it's way too easy to accumulate jargon. Right. And, you know, start communities based on jargon. Hmm. And I mean, I don't know if you've tried this recently, but I'm living three generations right now in the house together. I've never tried that. It's hard. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. Mm -hmm. And it, it's hard because who I am to my son and how I am with my mother are really different. Mm -hmm. And how I negotiate and navigate my son's struggle with my mother and my mother's struggle with my son's girlfriend and my, you know, and the thing about it is that in this community, there is no back door. Right. There is no back door. Right. And it's intergenerational. And, you know, it's like, I didn't, I didn't have any kind of a interview process to figure out if I was going to live with my mother and son and his girlfriend. Mm -hmm. It just happened. Mm -hmm. And, and navigating that, that those relationships so that the relationships can make more relationships mm -hmm. so that they can grow and learn. It's, where each battle is not a battle to be won. Mm -hmm. It's a nourishment of the soil of what next year is going to look like. Like, how would you raise your kids differently if you knew they were never going to leave home? Right. <laughs> Interesting question. But uh, that's a community question. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So one thing we find there is that like the, um, you know, the chore wheel. Okay. The chore wheel is something that's part of communities too. You sign up for times when you need to do things and right. people are kind of taking, showing responsibility by um, participating in an organized framework of how the structure of the system will be maintained. Right, the dishes, the this, the that, the bathrooms, the whatever. Map and territory. Mm -hmm. I don't want my kids to do dishes because it's Wednesday. Mm -hmm. I want them to look around the room and think, I think I need to do the dishes tonight. Everybody's busy. Mm -hmm. It would be good for me to do it tonight. That's awesome. Right? Do you see the difference? I see the, it's very clear. The, the One is a script, the other is improvisation. And it's a completely different way of being in relationship. That's very powerful. It's a very simple but powerful example. So yes, I, I got that from you when I spoke with you before also, which was there needs to be a lot of room for people to improvise in, mm. in whatever structures get set up for communal engagement. Uh, so, uh, Nora, I'm going to finish with this, even though I feel like we could probably have 10 more conversations and maybe we will, um, because it's an important, you know, I love, I love the work that you do. And I love the fact that it applies to everything. You, know? <laughs> you, you, you can sort of, we could, I could talk to you about community or I could talk to you about just about anything and we could apply the same it's a it's a different way of seeing and right and, and it wants right. to be applied yeah everywhere mm -hmm. everywhere it's fantastic um it's so good to talk to you again you too it's really good to talk to you and i will send you this when i've edited the you know a written version so you can take a look at it before we print um but i'm really glad that we have this i felt like we needed this view on community to really lay out some of the, I don't know, the, the deeper issues that are, that if we don't address them, they'll, no matter what we do mm -hmm. in community, the same pathologies will keep showing up. And they do. And they do. And this is, you know, this is why people get discouraged, but you know, in a way we can't get discouraged because the biggest community we all are one of we all live in a community called the human family and there's no back door to that one either <laughs> so you know somehow we have to learn how to get along uh and you know right now we're not doing so great um no but you know we keep trying what else are we going to do um yeah and uh yeah the the human family is there isn't a back door, and that is the community. That's the big community. Right. And, and I, I often say, if we can't, if I can't get 400 people together in an online community and have it and, and demonstrate something that works, how are we ever going to make the whole human family work? Yeah. So, Nora, thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll be in touch. Okay, Much but first you have to show me your shirt. I want to see your shirt. Ah, oh, you know what it is? It's, it's an HP Lovecraft. Uh, cool. cool. I love it. That's <laughs> yeah, what I thought it was. It was like <laughs> there's some tentacle stuff going on here. It's kind of some kind of uh, Cthulhu mythos creature. It's excellent. I love it. All right. All right. So great to see you, Jeff. Take care. And Thank you.